What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Dirt to Dust. Doug Langford here, your host, along with my co-host, Caleb Forbes. Caleb, what's up, buddy? Oh, not too much. How are we doing today? I'm uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Got um, got a lot of stuff to talk about today. I got a really good idea for a, a podcast episode while shopping for a Jeep this weekend. Ooh, but uh, okay, all right. Yeah, I know. You know what do we what do we do this weekend? What uh, I, I'm assuming you didn't shop for a Jeep this weekend. I did not shop for a Jeep this weekend. <laughs> uh, I went to a, a niece's birthday party. I got her like kind of a toy jeep but uh <laughs> other than that i just detailed the grand cherokee uh not much going on in jeep world on my side the lj is still in progress um uh, but uh so tell me about this new jeep what are you thinking well i i spent a lot of time this weekend in like hockey dad mode because my mm-hmm. son he's he's hey he's big into hockey so we found out that his you know his skates weren't the right size or whatever he's got little skinny feet you know we can thank his mom for that so we took him out and you know, during in the drive kind of going out and back, I said, you know, I I, I sold the Gladiator. So the Hemi Swap Gladiator, she's right. gone. I know you know that. So a lot of people, apparently a lot of people didn't know that. So that one's gone as of, I don't know, three, four weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And then Pretty Ryan, recent. yeah, Ryan from Outlaw Off-Road Atlanta uh, actually has purchased Reaper, you know, the right. original kind of Outlaw JL. Mm-hmm. And that's been, what was that, like seven, eight, six, seven months ago? It's been a while. It's been a little bit, yeah. Yeah, to he's the been, point I know where he's been enjoying that one a ton. He actually told me, uh, he told me this weekend that you were actually designing some new graphics for him. I am, and that Reaper. He's like, I, don't, I'm not, I know you're going to get mad, but Reaper's coming off the hood. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, <laughs> yeah, he, he wants to make it his. And uh, yeah, I think it's time for a new wrap. I think it's time for some new color changes. Um, I've been working on a pretty cool design with him. We've talked about possibly doing like a full, full, full wrap. And the guys at uh, Atlanta Custom Wraps, I don't know if you've seen them. They've been, they're pretty big on Instagram, YouTube. He does a lot of the Atlanta-based rappers, like musician rappers, uh, vehicles, Young Dolph and those guys. Uh, so we're talking about like a legit, like professional, professional rap shop. Doing Probably this. better than anything I ever did to it. <laughs> Maybe, but we're going to, we're going to try to cool, pull something out that's pretty cool design wise. And I think, I think we're on a really cool track for that. So I'm excited to see what Ryan does, but no, I'm glad so, to see Reaper getting, getting a second life. It certainly was not getting driven to its capability uh, in my possession with having the gladiator and having the, the race car. But right. that said, with those vehicles gone, um, this is kind of, you know, yeah, I've got 4699, but that's not really something that you take out weekend wheel. And it's not something no. you take to your local gears and beers, your local Jeep event, stuff like that. I said, man, I really need to, I really need to get another Jeep. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I started talking about it, started thinking about it. And I'm like, you know, I need to, I don't really care if it's a, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in that process right now of, you know, options. What do I want? What do I not care about? What am I going to do it? How am I going to build it? And I was mm-hmm. like, you know, this is probably a conversation that lots of people have all the time, not just me. And, you know, I kind of tried to put myself in there and then it was like, boom topic because I see a lot of these quote requests that come into the outlaw off-road shops. And I, I've talked to customers myself and, you know, there, there's kind of that age old question, you know, when we talk about the, how we lift vehicles and what we do, you know, we talk about budget, we talk about intended use, we talk about all that. And I was like, you know, let's, let's do an episode that compares a cheaper, lower end lift kit, but that has more componentry okay. versus all right. more expensive, like, you know, made in USA kind of kit, right? Like a higher mm. end, higher quality, just everything's better. But because of that, there's less parts and it may even cost more. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of dive into that. We've got some time to do it, but that was kind of my idea for, for a podcast of comparing a cheaper, more componented kit versus a more expensive, less componented kit. So that's like kind of it. what I want to do. So if, if you can get on board with that, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get this thing going. Let's get underway here. I, I think we can talk about this for a little bit for sure. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, 
and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to to Dust. Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. Welcome back, everyone. So, uh, yeah, let's get into this, Caleb. Let's talk about this lift kit. I don't know. Do you think it's a debate? Is it really a debate or is it just, I don't know. What What do you think about it? I don't think it's a debate. I think it's more a question that every single Jeep owner or person looking to modify their vehicle really needs to ask themselves. Um, and th- that's kind of the four questions that we go over at Outlaw all the time that kind of wraps into that, those same things. You know, what's your intended use of the vehicle? What's your budget? Do you care more about ride quality or offer performance? And kind of make a decision from there. But I know there's a lot of variables there. Like you said, some of these kits include more components technically that can correct geometry, can correct steering, um, but maybe not have the longevity of some other parts. Um, Personally, I've I've gone down the road of of buying the cheaper option um, or the more budget friendly option only to come full circle around every single time and end up buying the more expensive option, the, the higher quality parts down the road anyways. And for my intended use, um, the LJ being the most recent, but I've had, man, I've had the every generation of the Wrangler name. I've had YJs, TJs, LJs, JKs, and JLs, <laughs> everything from 32 inch tall all terrains to, you know, 40 inch tall. And now the LJ is going on 43. So my mindset is buy once, cry once. If I can't afford what I want immediately, I'm, I'm going to wait. I'm going to, I'm personally going to splurge for the best that I can get. Um, but some of those kits, I know like rock crawler, for example, um, you're able to build um, those kits and upgrade as you go, which is a fantastic option. Um, but yeah, it does come at a higher price point initially. So for me, that's my personal go-to is just do it all at once. Um, but I can absolutely understand someone, let's say, let's take my fiance, for example. Uh, we bought her four by EJL a year and a half ago. Um, and it's my been initial, long. it's been that long already. We've, we've put yeah, 10,000 cool. miles on the thing already. It's awesome. Okay. Uh, but my my immediate thought was, oh man, let's put thirty eights on it. Let's do uh, rock crawler suspension. Let's re gear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. um, and then immediately she's like, hold on, I'm not going off road with this. So I- you're rolling, big guy. <laughs> you're rolling. So she's like, I'm not going off road with this. She's like, I I want it to look good. I want it to ride really good on the highway. She's like, that that's all I care about. And I'm like, okay, fair. Um, cool. We're gonna we're gonna roll this back a little bit. And we ended up doing like a, a Terraflex leveling kit in 35s and some bumpers and s- steps. Um, so that's kind of the other end of the spectrum there, which is a very budget friendly build. And hers looks phenomenal. I mean, it it looks great. I can't I can't say anything bad about it whatsoever. Um, but what what are your thoughts? Where do you where which kind of path do you you tend to go and how do you figure this out for your customers? Well, you think about it this way. Who do you who do you think is a bigger part of the off-road market nowadays? Your fiance with that JL four by E or you with your super built LJ? And Her we both sure. know the answer to that question. Her right. Sure. It, it's the same thing. My wife, same thing. Um, she just bought a new a new SUV. And the first thing was, yeah, I wanna I wanna modify it some. And it wasn't a vehicle that has a lot of availability for modification. It's a new uh, Ford Expedition, but there is a two inch <laughs> facer kit out there for it, and we can put up 33s on it. Wow, now okay. is that something I'm gonna buy and, and modify that way? No, I mean, personally, you know, we talk about me shopping for a Jeep, and this isn't really a question for me because I already know it's going on, it's probably going on three and a half inch long arm, shave the fenders, throw 38s on it, and then I'll do other stuff to it. So, because I know what I want out of a vehicle and I really like the flexibility of the long arm and all that kind of stuff. So I already know what I'm going to do, but I understand that I am big time in the minority. And, and it took me a lot of years to say, to admit that, yeah, I could actually see where, um, and, and it's actually changed now to where most people, when they buy these vehicles and that could be whether it's a Jeep, it doesn't matter if it's a Subaru or a truck, whatever, 
the overwhelming majority of these vehicles they're never going to see they're never going to see off-road much less four-wheel drive right like they're, they're just not going to see it so do i would i still suggest a high-end lift to a customer even though it's not what they need typically no but yeah in in the circumstance where ride quality was a big thing to them i would at least educate them and say look this is the difference you know you talked about the four questions you know one of those four questions is how important on a scale of one to ten is ride quality mm -hmm. if they're telling me they're a four five six which everybody watching is like oh no ride quality is a 10. i'm here to tell you um the last time i there's not a lot of customers that tell me 10. right they they're they're usually somewhere six to eight is the number that I get a lot. And we get a lot that are like, I don't really care about ride quality. It's a Jeep or I don't really care about ride quality is what it is. Or they're just assuming that pretty much everything on the market is going to be okay. Um, and to an extent, they're kind of right. So do I have necessarily a problem with giving somebody a kit that's going to be the quality of the parts? Maybe not there. The longevity from my experience, I know may not be there. But understanding that in the world that we live in, the average customer is only going to keep their vehicle two to two and a half years on average. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very good point too. Yeah, um, if if, if you're you not know, planning to, if you're not one of those people that keep vehicles super long term, then makes a difference. Why, why put ten thousand dollars worth of suspension into it when you know you're just going to turn around and probably sell that vehicle with that suspension in it? And that's a ten thousand dollar loss. Why do you care about? If you're not keeping it in life. Right? <laughs> right. I get the benefit of a lifetime warranty. Certainly. I absolutely do. Having had to use it once or twice. Um, so I certainly get that. But would I rather now it's, would I rather to deliver this to a customer? Would I rather say I can give you a better riding vehicle because I can correct caster because I can correct axle centering because I can correct for all of this stuff for less money because you're buying a lower quality part but you're getting more parts. I mean, it's the difference between right. going to a dealership and buying a Kia or a Hyundai and going and buying a BMW or Mercedes. Mm -hmm. They're both going to get you to point A or point B. The Mercedes is going to look better doing it. It's going to have more options. It's going to make you more comfortable getting you on you know point A to point B on your road trip. It's probably going to last longer. And there is some argument to be made there, but there's going to be differences. But the purpose for which they're built to get in it, start the engine and drive to work. Get in it, start the engine, drive to the beach, drive to the mountains, do the vacation. More than likely, it's going to do that. Now, one may do it better 10 years from now. You know, that Kia may start showing some some signs that, you know, the paint wasn't as nice mm -hmm. or the metal wasn't as nice or the, you know, the suspension or the whatever. But again, we talk about, you know, somebody's only keeping the vehicle two and a half, three years. I mean, I don't want to be like, you know, it's somebody else's problem. But if you're buying a used car, it kind of, you got to know what you're doing. So I, <laughs> I can definitely see both ends of it especially having seen where the market i think is going and definitely has gone certainly post covid where um the market is changing um you know i i you know i kind of blame jeep for that when they came out with the jl and it was you know the seats were nicer and the interior was nicer and the leather was nicer and the dash was nicer and the audio was better like everything was nicer and they started all of a sudden we've got this whole new group of jeepers quote unquote to service and to to do installations for and it's you know it's it's different and they want different things and they need different things you know there's accountants and doctors and lawyers and you know and they don't really care about where does the four-wheel drive stick go for four low they like they don't care about that <laughs> i can i can right? attest to that that's i don't you think Brittany has that. one time put it in put her jeep in four-wheel drive now i've driven that jeep probably more than she has in, being in the driver's seat rather um, but yeah, she doesn't care about those things. She bought that Jeep because she wanted triple white. So white hard top, white fenders, white body. She wanted the one touch sky, uh, soft top or hybrid top. Um, and she wanted led headlights and on her absolute list was, I have to have leather and I want at minimum heated seats, which at the time Jeep didn't, Jeep didn't have cooled seats, but I think they're coming. I think they either come out with those for the 24 or they're, they're look, look, working on it. But either way, um, those are all things her previous vehicle had, and those were on her list. She's like, I'm not going without that, those things. She's like, I want those things. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> so yeah, she is the market. She is the market. These are the people that have been brought to the market that were not previously in 
the market. They just weren't. Right. It just wasn't a thing. They thought it was, you know, some stupid redneck thing. But now they see it and they're like, oh, wait, I can actually kind of, I can meld together off-road performance or in most of the time it's off-road looks. Mm -hmm. It looks like it would be off-road performance, but I can still drive this thing around and it's not going to drive like crap because everybody, you know, I've, I've knocked on them too. I mean, everybody knocks on, you know, rough country. We're going to pick on rough country a little bit. There's a reason rough country is the biggest suspension company in the world. Oh, absolutely. After when, when you speak about aftermarket, I mean, I know we're not talking about Tenneco or any of that, but when it comes to aftermarket suspension, rough country is the biggest like they yeah. are huge yeah. now you can have that argument about their powder coating or the springs or you, there there's arguments to be had from a quality standpoint I'm, I'm i can have that conversation with anybody but if you're not using it to the extent that it would um, kind of see its see the extent of its use to where mm -hmm. it would just be like yeah do this anymore this is the edge of my performance capability right if you're not going to use it to that and the most capability you need out of it is hitting some speed bumps at target uh, you can um, do that. avoid the target <laughs> things are evil uh then why would you spend more and and it hurts my soul like deep down to kind of say like why would you spend more because i could have that i can still have that conversation but just because i want to say it just because i can explain it and i would be right it doesn't mean that customer is going to buy. And when you're in the, you know, my opinion is definitely affected by the fact that I have customers to service. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of customers across the outlaw brain that we have to service. And yet we just can't do that by forcing our own opinion. So, right. you know, like I said, like you said, you're certainly going to build the LJ a certain way. I'm certainly going to build my neck because my next Jeep is saying, you know, a certain way. And, you know, maybe that's helpful to some customers, but it's certainly not helpful to every customer. So, right. It's tough, man. It's tough to realize that. But once and, you do, you're like, you know, you know, we, we are, you know, trying to be inclusive, right? You got to be inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be inclusive. I mean, honestly, though, if, if if I were to go out and buy a, let's just say, a, I don't know, something my style. Let's say I go out and buy a brand new 392 in Anvil Rubicon. I can't truthfully. Wait, 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 hold on. Why do you have to throw the anvil color in there? You know they're not making the anvil three ninety two, right? I know I, you have hopes and dreams. Oh, they they're making the anvil three ninety two. I've I've seen a couple of them already. Um, no, but, well, I think they. I was told they were supposed to, and then they started, and then they were like, "Yeah, we're not doing it," and they stopped production. They might have. Either way, it's just an yeah, example. Yeah. I can't afford a three ninety two. If I were to go out and buy something like that, though pretty top of the line jeep i can't honestly tell myself that i'm gonna throw everything at it um especially with having the lj the way it's going in the path it's going down um i would I probably do something very similar to, to britney's throw a leveling kit on it throw some 35s maybe some 37s because a 392 or rubicon really looks good on 37s um but that would honestly be more for looks than offered performance i can't say that i would go off and wheel that thing very much that's that's what i'm building the lj for um, so I can kind of put myself in the shoes of a new Jeep owner and the new customer base who are not quite the hardcore people. Um, but that's also why I'm going to, those kind of people I'm going to recommend like, Hey, did you, did you see the buggy for sale on Facebook marketplace? Yeah, because <laughs> we can teach you some really cool things with that too. Um, well, but, remember when Jeeps were like, I don't know, 30 to 35 brand new when the, mm -hmm. when the, when the JKU came out and it was like, I don't know, 30, uh, 30 ish. And that was a good, but now it's like, dude, I was pricing them up. I was looking at them. A, a decent Rubicon is sixty-five to seventy thousand mm dollars -hmm. brand new. Yeah. Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and I get the reason. I know there's reasons for that, but people, normal people, of which we are not, uh, we are not members of that group. Uh, I don't plan on being members of that group for better or for worse. Normal people are looking at that, going, "Why in the world would I drop sixty k plus on a vehicle?" And then go out and do something that's going to cause any damage to it. Because right. while we look at rash on a bead lockering as a badge of honor, while I look at uh, body damage as just another story, the vast majority of the general public doesn't want anything to do with that. No. That gives them nightmares and cold sweats. Right. Like they just, uh -uh, I'm not doing it. Mm -mm, mm -mm, no, no, no. I, I got, mm -mm, not again, doing it. I understand. I didn't understand it before, uh, <laughs> before I met Brittany and, and, you know, I, 
I'd never had a significant other that really cared about anything Jeep related. They just kind of put up with it because I did it. Um, but having being engaged to someone to, who is who's is actually into it, loves the Jeep shows. She she goes to almost every single one with me. Um, yeah, that's just that's not something that crosses her mind of, oh, I can't wait to see what this thing can do on the trail. Absolutely not. Um, but what does make me excited is she's like, hey, can you take help me take my doors off? Yes, <laughs> but it's That's hers was in the same boat. I think her four by E was somewhere <clears throat> in the 60 to 65 range and yep. it doesn't even have power seats. So yeah, right. uh, why, why risk take that off road and, and scratching it up or denting anything. And right. when you've right. got that big of a payment on something, especially cause I, I don't know anyone who's buying those things cash out. And that's if your local dealership isn't marking them up. Um, to some of them are even trying to still trying to do mark COVID markups, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, I think, I think a lot of people gotten out of that. Thank God that was dumb. Yeah, it's dumb. Yeah. But yeah. so let's kind of shift gears here just a little bit. Um, let's, I'm going to play devil's advocate here and say, all right, let's, let's say that we do push the higher end suspension or we have a customer who's looking at the higher end suspension. Um, what, what makes it more expensive? Like I'm, obviously you're, you're comparing component, Quality or a quantity of components to quality, but You're like, about like what makes the price different? Yeah. Like what actually, what actually goes into it? Uh, I, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's probably a lot simpler and we could do a whole nother episode on mm -hmm. this, but to boil it down to its simplest parts, it's quantity and quality. Um, it's the quantity of parts and the quality of those parts. So obviously the quantity of parts is going to drive a price up because you're buying more stuff, right? If I go buy, right. 10 chicken nuggets and versus six chicken nuggets, the 10 is probably going to cost me a little more. Now, yes, I am a 10 piece guy because I love chicken tendies, but it's going to cost me more than if it, than if I bought a six. Now, if I go to that, that that's if it's, a, you know, if a 10 pieces and I'm out of touch here because I don't go to McDonald's, but if a McDonald's 10 piece chicken nuggets, three bucks, but then I go down the road, we've got a place here in town called Roadies. And it's just kind of like this little sports bar. If I go buy 10 chicken tenders at Roadies, it's going to cost me two or three times as much. Right. You know, the difference is it's not that pulled apart processed, you know, little bitty. It's like legit chicken tenders that have been hand bred. So it's a different chicken tender, right? But it's basically the same deal. Like if I'm going to go buy, you know, I had on Rough Country a minute ago. If I go to Rough Country, not all of their stuff is U.S. made. Some of it is. Mm -hmm. a, little, a couple of things are made here and there. But it's generally going to be produced in Asia. Um, the welds aren't going to be – are going to be generally different. They're going to be kind of lower end robot robotic welds. Um, the powder coat might not be as good. I mean, the, the rubber in the bush, you know, it's all going to be not as high end. Right. But if I go buy something like an Evo or a metal cloak or a JKS or rock crawler, something like that, where either the vast majority of, or all of is produced here in the U S to a higher standard, um, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting more part. I might get less parts with say the metal cloak kit, but I'm getting a better part than I did with say the rough country kit. So yeah, it's just quantity and quality. And if you do both of those, you know, you, now that's when you get into the really high end kit. And people are like, how can a lift kit cost $2,000 or $3,000 or whatever? And I'm going, look at the parts list and then, then look at the quantity of those parts and then look at the quality of those parts. Um, and without going long arm or coil or something crazy, I mean, that's about as good as you're going to get for a, quote unquote, bolt on kit. And, you know, if you go do a rock crawler adventure X, you know, full on eight arm kit, there's really not much out there on the market better. Right. That is full alignment, adjustability, full geometry correction, full everything, really good shocks, really high end stuff. The control arms are straight, solid bar. They're not tube. The joints are frigging insane. I know I've got them on the race car. Everything is as good as it can be. Now, do you need everything as good as it can be? Yeah, I mean, the market we're talking about? No, probably not, which is why that might not be the right kit for you. And it probably isn't. Uh, but like you said, they do have other options. Um, but then the price difference becomes quality, not quantity, right? So if I do the same kit, Rock Crawler to Rough Country, and they have the same amount of arms and the same amount of parts, but Rock Crawler still more, well, then we're not in quantity, we're in quality. And now you're talking about R&D money spent. You're talking about all kinds of stuff. That's why I talked about we can get into it much deeper, but... Basically, it's quantity and quality and, you know, something else I, you know, we didn't touch on, you know, sometimes, I'm not saying this is all the time, 
there is a there is a possibility that sometimes I can actually get a cheaper kit to ride better mm -hmm. because I'm able to get those parts. You know, in a Jeep, for example, or any any solid axle vehicle, caster adjustment's huge. Oh yeah, that's probably one of the it's most important things. Right. And that was actually going to be my next question going into that was even with a cheaper lift kit, what are the key components that we need to be looking out for uh, to to well, what are we? What are we going to suggest to a customer that on the cheaper side that has these components, I guess, is a better way to say that. I'll break it down into kind of two categories. So solid axle and then IFS. Right. Um, right. Because we're not just talking to Jeep people here. Correct. Um, Correct. When it comes, we'll do IFS first. So when it comes to IFS, generally kits are either going to do spacers or they're going to just do new full strut assemblies. Either way, you're basically getting the front lift off of and if you're IRS in, you know, wherever the strut is, you're getting the lift off elongating in some way, shape or form that front strut. Um, the parts then that become important generally over about three inches are upper control arms, upper ball joints generally, but usually coming up for control arms because of camber adjustment. I just said, talked about caster, camber is another adjustment, toe is another adjustment. Those are your three um, alignment adjustments. So when you're talking about IFS, you know, there's only so much that that upper ball joint can move to be able to give you the caster. So when you get up above a certain amount of inches, you need an arm that's kind of pre-bent to give you that extra camber so that the mm -hmm. tire can stand. Camber is just the angle of the tire standing straight up and down for those uh, of you who are listening that don't know. Um, you know, you want that as close to zero as possible. So that's a big thing on IFS. Caster somewhat is important, but it's more, you know, on a solid axle vehicle, generally from the factory, it's not adjustable, but on an IFS vehicle, it generally is. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't, it's much easier to, to make it adjustable. Um, and then toe is just an adjustment, but that's the same on, that's the same on solid axle. So it's a, it's probably a little easier to get those adjustments in an IFS. So like a Bronco or a forerunner Tacoma, right. um, something like that. Um, but when you go to solid axle, which is, it's, that's most of what's lifted out there. Um, not by much. When you factor in trucks and, you know, F-150s and Chevy Silverados that are IFS, especially with the, you know, the coming out with the new, the new Bronco that's been out for a new couple of years now. And then we've got the new, um, all the new stuff that Toyota's putting out. That's all going to be IFS. Um, but Solid Axle's still there and it still dominates the market as we sit here and record this episode. Right. Caster at that point is really only adjustable because it's a four link. It has two upper control arms, it has two lower control arms, totally different system. You're only going to get that with those arms being longer and or adjustable because caster comes from rotating the axle. Caster basically is the degrees. If you drew a line through the, again, for those that don't know, if you draw a straight line through the upper and lower ball joints, that degree away from zero is your caster. You know, is it five degrees, six degrees, whatever. And I'm talking about very small movements here. You know, factories probably low to mid fours. When it's coming from the factory and when it's lifted, we go for low to mid fives mm -hmm. generally. Um, you know, when the jail first came out, everybody was like, Oh, we gotta get seven. The more the better. And we realized pretty quick that was not the way. That's not the way. That was not the way. <laughs> Five and a half to six. The Mandalorian says, This is the way. Um, so that's the only way to get it. And that requires more parts and arms cost more than cam bolt kits, right? For an IFS. So right. um, so when I'm looking at a complete kit. Uh, for IFS, I'm just looking at those things, looking, you know, does it have a diff drop? Does it have, does it have control arms or does it have something to adjust the camber or the caster? Little, little, little bolts and nuts that will do that on an IFS. Not so much on, um, on a solid axle and solid axle also has that magical thing called a track bar that controls the body centering over the axle. So right. when we talk about solid right. axle and I did an episode on this on let's get after it season one, it was towards the beginning about what kind of, what kind of, what do I think a complete kit is? And we talked about, aside from the normal stuff, right, shock, springs, sway bar link, stuff like that, was a front track bar, front adjustable track bar, so you can move that axle underneath that body to get everything flush. Uh, at least front lower control arms that are either longer specifically for that lift height mm -hmm. or that are adjustable. doesn't really matter which one you do. Um, there's pluses and minuses to each, and that, again, that's, I think we did an episode on that, and let's get after it too. But um, And then some kind of... You don't need a rear track bar, but a, a relocate bracket to make it more horizontal and to place that right so that the rear um, is right. So those are kind of the things that I look for in a complete, what I would, I would consider a complete lift kit. Obviously, there's kits that have way more stuff. There's kits that have way less stuff. But that's kind of that middle of the road that's going to give us as installers, number one, everything we need to make us feel like we've got you a good kit. Number two, 
kind of feel like we put our stamp on it for ride quality. Now, right. that doesn't mean that every kit we do has all that stuff in it, but we're going to at least educate the customer to that and go, this is what we recommend. Does it work for you? Yeah. Does it answer your four yeah. questions? Does it work with your budget? If it does, awesome. If it doesn't, okay, let's go up or let's go down. But that's kind of where I start. Right. So regardless of brand or quality, those are the things that we're going to start with to try to get you to have the best ride, regardless hopefully. of what your yeah, budget hopefully. is. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Or at least, you know, and I've done it before where somebody comes in and says, hey, look, I got a hard budget. I'm like, okay, this is where I'm going to start you. Just know that this is what I recommend and that track bars make good Christmas presents. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, you know, or, I can hey, that. nice set of lower control arms, you know, that's not something nice to grab at tax time. So Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But as long as they know that, I think that's the big thing is a lot of people get on their high horse and they get on their ego and they go, oh, that kid is crap. It's garbage. No, it's not. It's not that bad, right? And I, and I was the same way years and years and years ago, but we all grow up, we learn. You know, I, as long as somebody knows what they're getting themselves into, and I don't say that as a negative, um, and they know what options are out there to make it better, then they're going to get in the car or they're going to get in the truck or they're going to get the Jeep or whatever. And make, okay, yeah, it does ride different. But I know that they already told me what I can do to make it better. Mm -hmm. So I can do that as funds become available, as time becomes available, as just the need, want, and desire becomes available, or as their intended use may change. Right. Then we all know right. there's people that buy, that buy vehicles, they're never going to off-road them, and then they get the bug and they go full on. So <clears throat> I would, I yeah, would definitely do that. Just make sure it's a brand that, you can add on parts and most brands these days have that where you're not just locked into buying one kit one time. Right. Um, you know, make sure that it's a brand that you can add parts, you know, Christmas presents, anniversary presents, tax time. Um, I, I personally think that control arms are great for Valentine's. I think I maybe even 4th of July, if you can give 4th of July presents, I mean, track bar for labor day, it's fine. So just keep that in mind. And I think, you know, I, it's not this big of a deal as some people on Facebook would make it sound. I don't think is a is what I'm trying to the point I'm trying to get across. Yeah, and that's um that's a whole other topic in itself. Is is we see this all the time on Facebook, and we're I mean I know you and I both are probably part of dozens of groups. Um, people tend to push what they think is the quote unquote the best, which I don't believe in the best, uh, simply because that's just what they run and. Um, but they don't really pay attention to like the nitty gritty of that. Um, so I think that's something that we as industry people should definitely be advocates for of explaining these things. And, and hopefully these, you know, we can get this episode out to a lot of those, uh, a lot of those people in the Jeep groups. Um, but don't, don't go off of Facebook general consensus just because 10 people are running rough country doesn't mean that's the best for you. Um, you know, definitely talk to and Outlaw is not the only shop, but talk to someone who who's who knows these things. Like any any well operating shop should be able to explain these things to you, and still keep within a budget, obviously. Um, but going back a little bit to the more expensive stuff too, what are some of the other things that make? So let's start with the oh, we started with Caster and Camber for you know IFS and Solid Axle. Um, what about the more expensive kits are upgrading those? Like, what am I getting more for paying more? The, well, we go back to, if we're not talking about quality, if we're not talking about quantity, yeah, I'm not talking about quantity. Like, yeah. We're talking about quality and what we're talking about quality, which is the big price driver that that's when you're talking about joint material, you're talking about shocks is a big one. Okay. That's a big driver in price between kits is, you know, did I get the base included shock or did I get, you know, Fox 2.5 performance elite or did I get Bill Stein 5160s or, you know, that's a big, big uh, kit for kit. And there's a lot of companies out there that don't sell shocks. There's a lot of suspension companies that don't make shocks mm -hmm. um, or, or they do, but it's only included in certain kits or, or, or whatever. Um, you know, Evo is one that comes to mind. Evo doesn't make shocks. They make suspension componentry and they make armor and they do stuff like that, but they've got a deal with King where you can buy the King shocks. Now, right. do you have to buy King shocks with Evo coils? No, of course not. Um, I did a test on Evo coils years ago with multiple kinds of shocks and they did fine. So you could change that. Just the difference between a set of Fox 2.0s to a set of Kings is thousands. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thousands of um, and to the average Jeeper that's just going around driving their Jeep around, you're not going to notice $3,000 worth of price difference. You're just not. Um, you know, resis are a big price driver in shocks. But again, if you're not driving something that's going to put your shock in a high heat environment, you're only paying 
you know, for looks, I tell people all the time, like, well, do I need reservoir shocks? And I look, look, you need reservoir shocks in two conditions. You're going to get your shocks hot all the time, or you're just willing to pay for badass factor. Yeah. That's the only two times you need reservoirs, <laughs> right? Right. Gladiator had reservoirs. I was paying for badass factor when I bought those shocks. I was not that the, my Mojave never saw the Mojave. It was supposed to, but the Hemi swap took too long. Um, so yeah, I was never going to use those shocks. They were three inch Fox factory Ray shocks. I was never going to use those shocks for what they were intended to do. And certainly not what they were capable of doing, but they looked freaking cool and they got a lot of attention at shows and Jeep booths and all that. So, so I did it. So I was, I was in that second category. So shocks is a big thing. Um, the type of steel, you know, there's a difference between U.S. steel and Asian steel. You know, just because something says steel doesn't mean it's 100% steel. This is true. The laws in China, the laws in China about what you can call steel are different than what you can call steel in America. Yeah. You know, in America, it might be, you know, 95% you have to have steel. Or in China, it's like, eh, give us like 65, bro. We're good. <laughs> you know, and that's just that's just what it is, people. That That's just the life. That's, you know, that's it. Um how they're welded. If you're paying a person to hand weld all of your stuff versus you've got some robots kind of throwing some welds down in a factory in Thailand somewhere or, or Indonesia or whatever, that's a big price difference. Uh, how are you coding it? You know, these aren't big things by themselves, but when you add up the 9, 10, 11, 12 different things that it takes to put a kit together, mm -hmm. when you start talking about processes and parts and pieces, that, that can be, that can add up, and it does, and it should. Um, R&D. Are you spending a ton of money on R&D? Are you not spending a ton of money on R&D? There are companies that go out there. When a vehicle comes out, they go, ah, we're going to take our best guess at it. They do it. They get it close. And they're not going to spend any more R&D. It's not in the budget. Right. Because if they did that, then you're going to complain because the price went up 100 bucks for each kit. <clears throat> they don't do that because they want to be able to sell you that $699.95 kit instead of making it $899.95. Right. Because – you know, that's the world we live in. And there are they going to get it that much better? Eh, it's debatable. But if they get it that much better, then that's not, then they're going against who they are anyway. Like if Rough Country all of a sudden decided to start racing an Ultra 4, that's not on brand for them. Right. It's just not something that they want to do. It's not something that's part of their business model, not in their mission statement. Plus, if they did, now that 699 kit's going to go to 999.95. I guarantee it. Somebody has to pay that money. They don't just have millions of dollars sitting around to go make a race team. Um, right. They just don't. Nobody does. So, well, I say nobody does. And Ford Motor Company goes out and does it. Um, but in general, <laughs> these aftermarket companies, they just don't have to do that. And they only generate their revenue by selling us all parts. So those parts have to cover X amount of dollars. So um, they're not going to do it because it's just not part of their business plan. But that does cost money and that factors into it. So, um, definitely the, definitely what shocks are a big thing, the processes and the parts and pieces of what they actually physically use to make the kit. And then the back end stuff, you know, the marketing, the R and D, all that kind of stuff, you know, whether we want to agree with it or not, all that stuff, all of it figures into how much that, that lift kit ends up costing you. And that goes way beyond lift kits. That's everything. That, yeah. That's but, anything you know, manufactured it, period. That's what it is. Um, yeah. So those chicken nuggets we talked about, <laughs> same thing, <laughs> same exact really thing. Um, so let's say I'm a new customer. Um, I told you my budget, we're already working through this and, um, I'm, I'm pretty set. I'm like, Hey, look, I just want the budget stuff. I, I want to, I want to save some money here. Um, what are some things that a customer needs to be aware of going with the cheaper kit that if they decide to keep the vehicle long term, like, Hey, heads up. Here's what we know are the first things to go out on these kits. Here's what you need to be looking for. And here's around a rough timeline and an abuse you can throw at it. Um, chicken tenders. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so I'm, it's a pretty common conversation, actually. I know it's kind of a hypothetical, but it happens all the time. It, it's something that um, I see a lot on, on, oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. I, I mean, it's honest. That's, I get that from a question I actually saw this morning. The guy was, was like, Hey, I'm, I'm looking at this. Um, actually I do think it was rough country. He's like, this is all I can spend on, on this kit. Um, I know it's not the best, but I can't afford more. What do I expect to replace in the next two years? And, and I kind of okay. just kind of, I kind uh, of memorize that question yeah, a little bit. I've, I've, I've answered that question many times. And I would just say, if you're a customer, I'm going to say, look, first of all, I'm glad that you understand what you're getting yourself into because 
Um, a lot of people don't. So appreciate you for being a smart customer on that. Kudos to you. Um, but if you are going to, if you're telling me that you're not going to use the vehicle a lot off road, you're not going to beat on the vehicle. And this is just going to be kind of a daily driver thing for you. Honestly, within the first two years, I don't expect you to have any issues. That said, if you go out and you do things, expect to have to replace everything. Cause that kit's just not made. It's just not made to do that. Um, but you know, joints are just not going to last as long. Mm -hmm. Shocks are not going to last as long. Keeping in mind that, you know, if you're buying a lower end kit, we already talked about it, the quality of the coatings, the quality of the weld, stuff right. like that, you're going to be stressing those components more than they are probably designed to do. And I get that people will go out and say on Facebook all the time, oh, I beat the crap out of mine on rough country this. And then I, I go see what they do. And I'm like, I don't feel like, I feel like you and I have different definitions of beating the crap out of something. <laughs> so yeah. When, when your definition of off-roading is kind of weekend warrior, I'm going to go hit some dirt trails and stuff like that. Um, I don't really consider that pushing any suspension system. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't consider that. Don't, that's not going to, that's not going to tear up a rough country system. It's not going to tear up a rock crawler system. It's not going to tear up metal cloak, JKS, Terraflex, any of those. Um, what I'm talking about is when you're actually putting some misalignment in those joints and you're actually compressing and stretching that, that rubber, that whatever, whatever joint material it is, you do that over and over and over again. I mean, that's the law of physics. Like it's going to wear down. That stuff is made to go through so many cycles. Right. So um, if you're truthful and you tell me you're not going to go oh, well, off-road it, I think you're going to be fine. If you're doing it for aesthetics, um, then I would look at things like, you know, expect to expect your shocks to go out. Mm -hmm. Right. Like at that point, don't expect shocks to last forever. Shocks at that, at that price point, shocks are disposable. Correct. Um, but there, but that's not, that might not be a big deal. Like you can go out, if you go out and you buy a set of those rough country in three, in threes now, I think they are in threes. Mm -hmm. That's their standard shock. That shock, I think is say it's 70 or 80 bucks or any shock that's 50 to $75. Mm -hmm. There's a ton in that price point. Do the math. Figure out how many times you'd have to replace those shocks to get to the price point of buying a set of Fox 2O Resi shocks at well over a thousand dollars. Right. You'd have to replace their shocks four freaking times. Who's the last person you ever knew that replaced their shocks four times because they needed to? I wish they did, but they don't. It's not gonna freaking happen. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there are some JK owners still still rocking the the factory rough country version one shocks from 2008. <laughs> they're fine, they're fine. <laughs> Absolutely fine. Now you take that thing off and they go, mm -mm -mm. Right. <laughs> no, they're not fine, bro. But that's, that's what I would say. I would just say, you know, just expect stuff to wear quicker, not necessarily break. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, it's not going to break. Right. Um, you know, I, you know, outside of the weird thing. And, and that's something too, that you got to realize too. It, it's, it's kind of like playing the reverse lottery, but the percentage chance of you breaking something, Evo, rock crawler, Terraflex, metal cloak that is a lot lower than breaking something rough country trucks trucks yeah trucks whatever skyjacker mm -hmm. some of those brands that aren't necessarily known for their quality the percentage is a little higher and that percentage goes up exponentially kind of like a curve it's compounding as you throw more abuse at it right so the more right. you ask it to do the more likely you are going to see a failure now is one failure more likely than the other? No, stuff breaks. You drive stuff differently. You hit you hit obstacles differently. Like it's just an overall compounding chance of stuff going wrong. But again, if if you're that customer on the budget, as long as you know that, um, it, it's on. It's kind of on you. Like I've I, I learned a long time ago. I have to stop taking responsibility for everybody's suspension choice. Yeah. Even though I sell it to them, it's not my responsibility to choose your lift for you. Mm -hmm. It is my responsibility to educate you. That is, that is our job. Some manufacturers that we sell don't like that. They don't like that I won't, that we won't push a certain brand all the time. But you mentioned it at the very beginning of this podcast, the four questions. If you answer those four questions, and those are what's your tire size, what is your intended use of the vehicle, scale of one to 10, how important is ride quality, and what is your budget? If you answer me those four questions, I will eliminate 90% of the product on the, on the market for you. Yeah. And that's, that's why those that questions point, are so important too. That's why they're there. That's why and that's why there. I spent, I did I mean, those questions. They weren't something I Googled. Like I developed those questions myself over years of not doing it right. <laughs> like, 
man, I really wish there was a system out there. I could kind of figure it out. And I figured it out. And it took me a few years to, to get that system. And we've been under that system for many, many years now at Outlaw. But, you know, when I finally realized, yeah, I can, I can apply these four questions to 99% of situations. Um, and as long as you don't go into it as a salesperson with any kind of preconceived biases and you're honest about it, there's really no way a customer can leave unhappy. Right. There really isn't. Right. Uh, and as long as you're, you know, you're educated on, on, on that and you, you know, you talked about other shops, I think our job is to educate, not necessarily to sell. Right. The sale is the, is the byproduct of the education. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think when, when somebody calls us, when somebody, yes, they're looking for a specific part, whether it's a suspension or tires, wheels, lights, whatever. But, you know, if they, if they knew everything already, they would just order it online and install it themselves. Correct. And right. Like I'm not going to go to a, I'm not going to go to a shop to have my lift kit installed. I know what I want. I know how to figure out what I want. I know how to install what I want. I don't need that service industry, but in that do it for me world, they're not calling us. Um, and some shops need to understand this. Cause I, I know shops that are out there. They just go, and no matter who calls them, no matter what they say, they pitch one brand. Yep. Um, Maybe I'm pissing somebody. Think, I'll piss some shops off here, but maybe you need to be pissed off. That's wrong. That is wrong. Hundred percent. That's wrong, <clears throat> and it's lazy. Um, and I just, I just think it's, I just, I think it's terrible. Yeah, but that's, I think our job is to educate. And I think as a customer, you need to find a shop that wants to educate you mm -hmm. versus just sell you. We all want to sell, right? We all want to make money. We all have bills to pay. Uh, it's just a difference of how we get there. And I think education yeah. is the best way to get there. Yeah, the shops that just push one brand. Um, and because they know damn well <laughs> what their profit margin is on that that lift kit, uh, those are the ones at the end of the day they don't expect to see you back in your sh in, in that shop as a customer. They just want the sale to one and done. And if your stuff breaks, who cares? Whatever, they'll sell it you another kit. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I think that's something that sets Outlaw apart for sure is the ability to build that relationship with the customer and. Uh, and maintain that and say, look, you can come back here anytime. If you've got more questions, we're going to try to answer this to the best of our knowledge. Um, but even looking outside uh, a shop space, I think something that's what could be very beneficial in, in getting out of those Facebook groups just online, go meet with your local, you know, four by four club, go ride in several different setups, ride with someone who's a little bit more spirited off road, ride with someone who's, who's more relaxed off road, or just what has a, says they have a great riding suspension on road. Um, you know, get, you get, think it's crap. get your butt in a seat <laughs> and, uh, and figure out what's best for you. What do you like? What do you don't like? Does something feel too stiff? Um, and I think, but again, the market, it's, we live in a lazy world, man. Yeah. Like people don't want to do that. I, if you can do that, you absolutely should. You should. But there's, there's just so many people that just want to make that phone call, put that, put that quote request in and just kind of be guided. Spoon fed the information. Um, <laughs> they just want to be spoon fed. And you know what? That's fine. Yeah. That if that's, if that's what you want, um, I'm here for it. I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to service you. I'm going to try to meet you where you're at. Um, while, while I certainly think your idea deserves a ton of credit, I think everybody should do it. Um, we, we, they're just not going to, I wish they did. I wish they I wish they would. did, but <laughs> it's not the world we live in. So that make, but that makes the four questions even more important. Right. That makes knowing what they want even more important to try to get that conversation because generally we're not sitting there across from them face to face. You know, we're, we're doing it via text message. We're doing it via email, a phone call, whatever. Um, and it just, it makes it even more important to get the right information as quickly as we can, uh, because they also don't want to spend an hour on the phone generally nobody wants to spend an hour hour and a half on the phone being educated they want you got to be quick you got to hit the point you got to hit the bullet points mm -hmm. and 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 move on they you know get that deposit set that set that install and give the customer what they want because you know these days that's 80 percent. that's you know that's what they want the so, Amazon way. Um, <laughs> i'm fine with that it, it is what it is man yeah it is what it is it, it is the amazon world it is. it is the amazon world that's what we live in so you know i'm fine like i was said i wish they would do what you what you said but I'm, I'm fine to meet them, meet them where they're at and do that low down, quick wham, bam, and get you where you need to go yeah, and, for and, sure. let's, and let's move on because that's what they want. Right. And so I guess kind of to wrap this up a little bit, I think we've definitely answered the question pretty well. Um, but I just want to kind of touch on these points. So if that is your question, if if you're looking at, do I go a little bit cheaper because this has more components, but this is what I can afford versus the more expensive, I think 
in based on this conversation, here are the things you need to ask yourself. So what matters most to you? Are you looking for initial price or longevity? Or are you thinking about replacing parts over time? How much abuse are you going to throw at it? What's your intended purpose? Um, answer those questions. And I think between that and then calling someone like Outlaw or any other well-informed shop that's there to ed educate you, um, I think you're going to have an answer and we'll be able to knock out, like Doug said, 90 to 95 percent of the brands immediately and, and really get you squared oh, sure. away on sure. um, on what's going to be best for you. Because, again, I don't believe that there is a best period. I believe there is a best for you in your situation. Um, Absolutely. 100%. And if, and if that, that didn't answer the question, then we will have another episode and dig even deeper. <laughs> <laughs> we can always do that. But yeah, I think, yeah, like you said, there's no such thing as best. I've said this a thousand million hundred jillion Google times, Googleplex times. Yeah, there's no best overall. There's best for, there's best for you, best for your situation. Um, and even then it might be a little stretch, but you know, that's the only way you're going to get me to use best. So right. yeah, I think right. that's, um, yeah, answer the four questions. Answer them before you call. I mean, you, you you listen to this, you know what the four questions are. Go watch the Let's Get After It episodes. We go into kind of each aspect of this um, where we talk about the components of a kit. What's complete? What's not complete? What are you looking for? We talk about shocks. We talk about coal. We talk about all that stuff. So go educate yourself if you have the time. If you don't, call a good shop. Get educated a little bit. Spend 10 minutes on the phone. And, and you know, you spend that time on the phone, then you should be um, – if you're if you're answering honestly and the shop is educated and, and knowledgeable enough, you should find yourself on the best kit for you or or your vehicle, your situation. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's probably more. the best the best advice I could give. Awesome. Well, I think I think we answered that question in its entirety. I think we're at about uh, almost an hour here. Uh, yep. So I think let's go ahead and wrap this one up, and uh, we'll start looking forward to more questions in the future. Um, if you've got any kind of questions yeah, you want so, answered, if, yeah, you, if you want to see a topic out, or there's something you're really interested in, definitely hit us up. Yeah, absolutely. Right, Make sure you, uh, you know, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And also coming up next week, just a little teaser for next week, we are going to dive in to the R and D question, um, on these lift kits. We hit on it a little bit today, but we're going to, we're going to dive into some research and development stuff. And then, um, a, a little super teaser kind of because of R and D a couple weeks, uh, I believe two weeks out, we have Dan four, the uh, founder and owner of Next Venture Motorsports out of Grand Junction, Colorado, one of the primary sponsors on the 4699 race car is going to be on here talking to us about Next Venture Motorsports. He's going to be talking to us about R&D. He's going to be talking all things Next Venture, parts development, all that kind of stuff should be uh, very educational for everyone on a company that uh, not a lot of people on the, I think more people on the West Coast have heard about them, not a lot on the East Coast. And we're going to try and we're going to try and fix that. So Can't we got that. that episode with that interview coming up. Pretty excited about that. So uh, yeah, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, appreciate you guys coming out here, spending a little time with us for the hour of your day, morning, evening, whatever that may be. Uh, come back and join us next time. We got the mailbag, mailbag dropping on Friday with some fresh questions. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. Caleb, appreciate you coming in. Always. man. Appreciate the uh, insight and the point of view as always. And we'll see you guys next week. You've been listening to the Dirt to Dust. Presented by Outlaw Off-Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime... To see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it.